Please be seated, and as you're getting seated, I invite you to open your Bible with me now to Exodus chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible with you, I do invite you to grab one of the Bibles underneath the seat there and open to Exodus 17 with us. If you don't own a Bible, then we would love to give you a Bible, and there are free copies out in the entryway there at the visitor center. We don't want you to leave here this morning without a Bible if you don't own one. But I do invite you to open up with us. And if you are new this morning and you are here for the first time, we are in a a sermon series where we have been working through the book of Exodus since the beginning of this year. And we find ourselves this morning in Exodus chapter 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. Well, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word to us this morning. We thank you that, Lord, your law is perfect and that it revives our souls. And so we pray that you would do your work in our hearts and in our lives by your word, not just today, but every day, so that we would be more conformed into the image of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Some of you know that one of my favorite series of books is the famous trilogy called The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. And many of you know that Tolkien was a Christian, and in those books, there are many Christian themes throughout that epic story. The story is really one long epic journey or a quest where the main characters face many dangers along the way. And one of the things that I have found so interesting about the story and that I think is very compelling is that along the journey, the dangers that the protagonists face come from different places. Some of the dangers that they face come from outside of themselves, but some of the greatest dangers that they face actually come from inside of themselves, from their own hearts. And I say that to you this morning, and I want you to think about that because there is a very similar dynamic going on in Exodus 17 in our passage this morning. In Exodus 17, God's people are on a journey. 
They have been saved from Egypt. God saved his people from Egypt, but after he brought them out of Egypt, they immediately went on a long journey to head to the promised land. And as we're going to see today, they faced some major problems along the way of that journey. And some of the problems came from outside of themselves, but some of the greatest problems actually came from inside of themselves, from their own hearts. And they would need God's help again and again and again, and they would need to be rescued again and again and again. And I hope that you can look at that and immediately see that we're no different. In fact, the, the, the scriptures say that the picture that you get of Israel in the New Testament is a picture of the Christian life for all of God's people. Because once God saves you and me, we are on a journey to the promised land. Except we're not heading to an earthly Canaan, we're heading to a heavenly Canaan. And that journey will end when we end, enter the kingdom of heaven. But... Scripture makes very clear that along the way, you're going to encounter many dangers, many toils, and many snares. Some of the dangers you're going to face are going to come from outside of yourself. Some of the dangers you're going to face are going to come from inside of yourself. So today I want to look at two problems that the Israelites faced along this journey and as we're going to see, these are not just two problems that they face, but they're two problems that every one of us faces as we journey through the Christian life. So let's look at them together. And the first one is actually an internal problem. We're going to start with the internal problem. Look with me again at chapter 17, the beginning of that chapter. It opens with these words. It says, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Now, this is not the first time that the Israelites have faced a water problem in the wilderness. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, you know that back in chapter 15, they also had a water problem. There was no water to drink, and the Lord miraculously provided water where there was no water. And then in the very next chapter, there wasn't any food, and God provided food by sending manna from heaven. And so God has already provided again and again and again, and yet here they are again, not trusting in the Lord. They should have known by now that God would take care of them, but instead of trusting in the Lord, they started grumbling again. And what we see here is that God's people have what I like to call spiritual amnesia. That's really what this is. It is a case of uh, an inability to remember that God has helped them again and again and again and has been faithful again and again and again. But as soon as they enter the next crisis... They either panic or they just start grumbling and complaining rather than trusting in the Lord. Now, lest we be too hard on them, be honest with yourself this morning and ask yourself, how often have you had a case of spiritual amnesia? How often do we reach a point in our lives where we, we can look back and see that the Lord has been faithful to us over and over and over again, and he has helped us over and over and over again. But when we enter the next crisis, we panic and struggle to trust the Lord because we don't remember what he has done. We are forgetful just like the Israelites. But I actually don't think that's their deepest problem here. The problem at Rephidim was not primarily that they lacked water, and it was not even primarily that they were forgetful. There's a deeper problem here, and it is their own hard hearts. Their hardness of heart was the greatest fundamental problem at Rephidim. And I say that because if you look at Psalm 95, which refers back to this event, 
it explicitly tells us that hardness of heart was what God's people were dealing with. Listen to these words in Psalm 95. It says, today, if you hear his voice, we just sung these words. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. What was the fundamental problem at this time? When they lacked water. Was it that they had a water problem? No, that wasn't the fundamental problem. Was it forgetful? Well, that was a problem, but it wasn't the fundamental problem. According to Psalm 95, it was that they had hardened their hearts. Their greatest problem was their own hard hearts. And there's something somewhat ironic about that when you think about it. Because when the people were in Egypt, what did they need to be saved from? They needed to be saved from Pharaoh's hard heart. And after they leave Egypt, what do they need to be saved from now? They need to be saved from their own hard hearts. They need to be saved from themselves. And I want to take that opportunity to remind you of something that you see in Scripture from cover to cover. And that is that according to Scripture, the greatest problem we face in this world is not something outside of us. It's something inside of us. Our greatest problem is ourselves. It's like that old cartoon from many, many decades ago, which says we've met the enemy and what he is us. The greatest enemy that we face is not something outside of ourselves. It is ourselves. It's our own hearts. The problems that you see manifesting themselves in the world today are problems that come from the human heart. If you need any evidence of that, just look at the teaching of Jesus. Here's what he said in Matthew 15, 19. He says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, and the list could go on and on and on. Jesus made clear that the problem was the human heart. I heard somebody say it once this way. They said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Uh, we don't just need to be rescued from sin. We need to be rescued from ourselves. The Israelites didn't just need to be rescued from Egypt. They needed to be rescued from themselves. And this right here is not just a water problem. It's a heart problem. They need what we need as well. A heart transplant. A spiritual heart transplant. Now, I want you to see what God does. Look at verse 5. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, I want you to see the picture that you have here. A number of biblical scholars have looked at this passage and have said that the scene that's set up is almost like a trial in a courtroom. God stands on one side and he's facing exact opposite to the Israelites who are standing on the other side and who are accusing God of not doing what he promised he was going to do. And, and Moses is caught in the middle. He's the mediator between God and his people. This is a case of Israel versus God. Now, God should have been putting the Israelites on trial for their own hard hearts, but actually what you have here is the people putting God on trial for his, I guess you might say, lack of faithfulness from their perspective. They are putting God on trial. They are accusing, through Moses, God of being unfaithful or uh, not good. I don't, I, I, whatever you want to say, to fill in that blank. But they, they are putting God on trial for his supposed lack of provision and calling his faithfulness and his goodness into question. And again, lest we be too hard on them, we need to ask ourselves, how many times have we been guilty of bringing God into the court of our own judgment? It's very easy to read the Old Testament, and I hear people say this all the time. Boy, the Israelites were sure pretty dumb, weren't they? I mean, they just didn't get it, did they? And we can say that, or we can say that about the disciples. And yet, we don't stop to look at ourselves and see that we are 
so much like them. How often have we been guilty of dragging God into the court of our judgment and judging God based upon our own understanding and thinking that we somehow know better than God, that our ways are wiser than God's ways. C.S. Lewis once wrote these words. He said, The ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge, and God is in the dock. That's what's happening in this chapter. God is in the dock. Now, if God wanted to, he could have instructed Moses to take that staff, which was the staff of judgment, through which God had executed judgment on the Egyptians. It was that same staff that had, had, had been lifted into the air and God's judgment was carried out on the Egyptians. He could have chosen to instruct Moses to lift up that staff and strike the Israelites dead right there. And he would have been fully justified in doing so. But that's what makes this passage so bizarre because what happens? Instead of striking the people with his judgment... He instructs Moses to strike the very rock on which God is standing. And when he does, water comes flowing out, showing once again what we saw in chapter 16 and chapter 15 and practically every chapter of this book, that God is merciful to undeserving sinners. But but this is not just a picture of God being merciful to undeserving sinners. There's actually a picture of something greater here because in the New Testament, Paul points back to this very incident and says it was a preview of something that would happen in Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Now, a lot of people read 1 Corinthians 10, they say, but that's a bizarre statement that he's making. Somehow, Paul identifies Christ with the rock that flowed in the wilderness. But what he is saying here is that just as Moses struck the rock with the staff of God's judgment and life giving water came flowing out in the wilderness, what would happen in Christ? Christ would be struck with the rod of God's judgment on the cross, and out came life-giving water. Out came salvation. In other words, the rock in Exodus 17 was a tiny little picture, a tiny little preview, not just of the mercy of God, but the salvation of God that would come through Christ. So what do we see in Exodus chapter 17? The first problem that the Israelites faced in the wilderness was not something outside of themselves. It was something inside of themselves. The first problem was their own hearts. They needed to be rescued from themselves. We need to be rescued from ourselves. And that can only come through Christ. But I want you to see that there's an external problem in this chapter too. We looked at the internal problem. Now, there's also along the journey... An external problem, and actually there was many external problems, but this is just the first one. It says in verse 8, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Uh, The Amalekites were a group of people. They were living in the northern portion of Sinai, and basically all you need to know is that they uh, were in an area that was directly between the Israelites and the Promised Land. So they stood in the way of passage to the promised land. And what the Israelites are being confronted with here for the first time since leaving Egypt is that their journey from Egypt to the promised land was not going to be smooth. Their journey was not going to be free from conflict. On their way to the promised land, they were going to encounter many enemies and they were going to encounter many enemies that would try to prevent them from entering the promised land. Now, again, we need to just stop there and say that is an incredibly important reminder of something about the Christian life. And that is that, as I said earlier, if you are a believer, you've been saved from sin. And now you're on a journey heading to the promised land. But God does not save you from sin and then say, okay, now you're going to have a life that is free from problems and is going to be smooth sailing until you get there. Wouldn't that be nice? He actually promises the exact opposite. 
Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. There will be many dangers, toils, and snares. But the difference is that in the New Testament, it says that our enemies are not going to be physical enemies like the Amalekites, but they will be spiritual powers working on behalf of Satan. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I know that the idea of spiritual warfare makes some people uncomfortable. But I'm not here to make you comfortable. So... <laughs> Um, this is a reality that scripture talks about, whether we like it or not, whether the modern world accepts it or not. Scripture says that the physical world that you see when you look out these windows and when you drive in your car every day and when you go to work and when you get your children ready, that physical world is not the only reality. There is an unseen spiritual realm and in that unseen spiritual realm, there is a cosmic war taking place. And many of the Issues that we face in our lives today, many of the evils that we face in our lives today are somehow mysteriously manifestations of a larger spiritual battle that is taking place. Listen again to those words. Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan and his armies want to do anything they can to prevent you from entering the promised land. The Amalekites stood in the way of Israel getting to the promised land. Well, let me tell you something. Satan wants to do anything that he can to try to prevent you as a Christian from entering the promised land. He wants you to question God's word. He wants you to question God's goodness. He wants you to wander from the path of discipleship and get lost and never come back. He wants to deceive you with false teaching. He will do anything that he can to try to trip you up and to try to prevent you from entering the promised land. Scripture says that he is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you what scripture says. So where does that leave us? What are we to do? Well, surprisingly, there's actually a very important piece of wisdom here in Exodus 17. Look back at how Moses responded to the Amalekites. Verse 9 says, So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. This is a really interesting scene. Uh, they didn't have camp chairs, so they had to bring a stone over for him to sit on. But uh, the, the, the image you have here is of Moses holding up his arms and it, it is only when he would hold up his arms, that they were going to prevail in the battle. Uh, now, now notice, it's Joshua and his forces that are fighting. And it's Joshua and his forces that are, are victorious in the battle. But what is made so clear here is that they are not victorious because of their own power. They're only victorious when Moses holds up his staff to heaven. And that's when the people are able to prevail. That staff, which has performed so many miracles in the past, is the staff which is going to enable them to win this battle. In other words, I think the overarching point here is that if they were going to be victorious, 
They were going to have to depend upon God and not on themselves. Philip Graham Ryken says this in commenting on this passage. He says, we do not know what Moses said while he was standing on the hillside. Nevertheless, his actions were an unmistakable sign of dependence upon God alone to win the battle. Moses was holding his staff, the instrument of divine power and the token of God's covenant promise. By holding it up to heaven, he was appealing for God to defend his people. They would have to depend upon God if they were going to win the battle. And here's the thing I want you to see. If we are going to prevail in the spiritual battle that we face throughout the Christian journey, we have to depend upon God as well. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability to prevail in the spiritual battles that you will face in this life, which is why we have to depend upon God. Now, how do we do that? You don't have the staff of Moses holding it up to heaven, but you do have another way to appeal to heaven, and that is through the power of prayer. Interestingly enough, if you look back at Ephesians 6, where Paul talks about the cosmic warfare that we face, he talks about the power of prayer. And he says in verses uh, 13, and then again in verse 18, he says, take up the whole armor of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Prayer is the primary weapon against the enemy, because it is with prayer that we depend upon God rather than depending upon ourselves. People overthink it. They say, well, how do I depend upon the Lord? How do I abide in the Lord? How do I do those things? What do I need to do? And you overthink it. The answer is prayer is the way in which we not only appeal to the Lord, but depend upon the Lord. And it's through prayer that we will be victorious. There's another indication in this passage that this victory was the Lord's victory and not the people's victory. And that's how the passage ends. You notice that after they're victorious, Moses does not build a monument to Joshua. Joshua and his armies win the battle. They could have put a statue there and say, we're going to make a statue and we're going to put a monument to Joshua because what a great commander he is. Do you notice that that's not what they did? They build an altar to the Lord. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. You know, a banner was something that soldiers would look to in the midst of a battle. You'd go into battle and you'd raise this banner, and the banner would often have the insignia of your army, and that banner was a source of identity. You could look to that banner and you could remember your identity. It was also a source of courage, because as long as the banner was flying, you knew that uh, the battle had not been lost. You know, it's been said that every single person has some kind of banner. Every single person has something that they look to for their identity, for their hope, for their security. And it's worth asking ourselves, okay, then what is our banner? Well, the way Moses answered that question was, he said, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is the one I look to for my identity. The Lord is the one I look to for my security. The Lord is the one I look to for my hope. And it's in him that I can be confident that I will win the battle. I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, Tolkien's story, The Lord of the Rings. And if, if you've ever read that story, there are so many different pictures and illustrations of the journey of the Christian life. It, it reminds us in those stories that our lives are a long journey. It reminds us that there are dangers, as I said, both outside of ourselves and inside of ourselves along the journey. It reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle and that there are many enemies that we will face along the way. But there's a moment about, about halfway through the trilogy. I say trilogy, but it's really just one long story that was broken into three books. But there's a moment about halfway through the whole trilogy where the characters are facing a very uncertain future. 
Um, at this point in the quest, the large company that they had been part of had been broken up and had been separated into multiple smaller groups. And they don't know whether um, their friends are still alive. They don't know where some of their friends even are at this point. They're under constant threat of enemies, the enemies of darkness, especially there's these nine dark riders who are, are sort of the, uh, the, the key leaders of the forces of darkness under the Lord Sauron, who is kind of a satanic figure in the story, if you haven't read it. And so they're in a very dark moment in the story at this point, but in the midst of the darkness, there's a moment where there's this glimmer of light because they're walking through the forest. A few of the characters are walking through the forest and they encounter Gandalf, who is this great wizard who previously had been their leader, but who had fallen into an abyss and had died. And somehow Gandalf had mysteriously and miraculously come back from the dead. And he meets them in the forest and he invites them to take courage and follow him and continue their journey. And at that moment, one of the main characters, Aragorn, says to Gandalf what I think are some of the most memorable lines in the book. He says this. He says, you are our captain and our banner. The dark Lord has nine, but we have one mightier than they, the white rider. He has passed through the fire and the abyss, and they shall fear him. We will go where he leads. I don't know what Tolkien was thinking when he wrote those words, but I have an idea. Our spiritual journey will have many dangers along the way. Sometimes it will appear that there is more darkness than there is light. But in those moments, we have to look to the banner. The Lord Jesus Christ is our banner, and he has not just passed through fire and the abyss. He's passed through death, and he's passed through the grave, and he is mightier than all the forces of darkness. They shall fear him, and if you have any question about that, just read the Gospels and look and see what happens when Jesus encountered any demons. They were terrified. The Lord Jesus is our banner. We will go where he leads, and where he leads, there will be victory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the banner of our lives. You're not just our banner, Lord, but you are our savior. It is only in you that we have salvation. It is only in you that we have eternal life. It is only in you that we have hope. And so we pray that you'd help us to look to you as the banner over our lives. Help us to follow you and take courage along the journey. Lord, as we walk this journey, protect us both from the dangers that are outside of us and the dangers that are inside of us. We pray that you would protect us from our own hearts that would so often lead us astray. And we pray that you would protect us from our enemies, Lord. Protect us from the evil one who would seek to lead us astray. We thank you, Lord, that you are greater than he who is in the world. We thank you that your victory is certain. And so we pray that you'd help us to continue following you in faithfulness. And we pray, Lord, that you would return soon. Come, Lord Jesus, for we are looking forward to the day when this journey will be over and when we will be united with all the saints in your kingdom and when you will make all things new. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.